What is up, YouTubers and Facebookers and all the Lucky Tackle Box fans of the internet? I'm Travis Moran, and we're going to be having some fun today. This is a long overdue topic that we've made um, smaller videos about, but today we're going through bank fishing basics, bank fishing 101, where I'm going to cover all the different things that, that I've learned over the years and hopefully are going to help you guys out. I know that uh, when we're fishing from the shore, we're often limited by a lot of variables uh, from no fishing areas, from the access we're actually able to get to the water if there's not too much brush um, and we're just limited to certain areas of the lakes. So we're instead of looking at what we don't have, we're going to look at how to take advantage of the opportunities that we do have on the water and all the things that we can do to maximize our chances. You can't treat it the same as if you had a boat. You really have to change your mindset, change a lot of the tools that you're using when you're out there to adapt to fishing from the shore um, because you do have less available to you, but sometimes having less options can help you narrow down and focus on, on the things that you do have. Uh, a lot of times too much can be overwhelming. So really looking forward to doing this, guys. The other thing is any questions you have, I'm going to sit around after I go through these different topics and uh, I will answer those questions for you. We'll sit around and we'll have a Q&A session. And I will answer all your guys' questions because I really, I love shore fishing. I know that we have a big shore fishing uh, subscription base. And so I want to make sure that we are uh, addressing you guys and, and I'm answering any kind of questions uh, because I know that a lot of times, a lot of anglers that are fishing from the shore are beginners are, are new to the sport of bass fishing as well and so there's a lot of lures a lot of techniques that you maybe are not familiar with or maybe that you didn't think that you could be fishing from the shore and i want to i want to get you guys caught up to date and confident to uh to be able to go out there and feel like you're going to catch big fish and, and lots of fish from the shore let's talk about the topics that we're going to go over when we're going over shore uh the bank basics 101 we're going to talk about um, first before you get out on the water, what things you can do, how you, what homework you can get done beforehand. Then we're going to talk about the equipment you need, other than the bait stuff, you know, the different little things that you should have in your bag or however uh, you're going to carry uh, all your equipment for the day. Uh, then we'll go over specific baits, uh, real versatile baits, uh, real baits that, uh, baits that you can uh, modify as you get out on the water to uh, to be able to fit the conditions. Uh, and then from there, we're going to talk about tactics. What do you need to do from the shore to uh, be able to present these baits, to be able to target the fish from the opposite side that you would be from a boat? Um, and then I'll talk more about going live on Saturday. Uh, you know, we talk about these baits. This is the routine we're getting into now is uh, um, on Wednesday nights, we go over uh, a topic and then on Saturday on the weekends, I actually head out on the water and then I go fish these particular baits. And so we can see them in action and you guys can ask additional questions and, and really see um, uh, what I'm talking about uh, in these bait top, uh, bait videos that we're doing right now. So couldn't be more excited. So let's get right into it, guys. Let's start with before we get out on the water. Um, as bass fishermen, there's we're all the same on this part. We think about bass fishing far more than we actually bass fish. So if we've got a trip coming up, if I know I'm going Saturday, I'm going to think about it Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, all the way to Friday until I actually am going out on the water Saturday. And so we're always going through our mind, what lures should I use? What do I think? How many fish do I think I'm going to catch? So let's first talk about some other little tactics that you guys can use to um to learn your water a little bit better. Um, the first one, I want to show you guys a trick, and this works for boats as well, but uh, Google Maps. Now, I'm going to do a screen share here, and I'm going to bring up the Google Maps. Where are we at here? All right. So the Google Maps here, and, uh, and we have a lake. Uh, this is Maloney's Reservoir. Now, I'm going to scroll down and I'm going to go to the launch ramp. Uh, I'm going to talk more about why launch ramps are great places to fish later on in tactics. But right now, I'm just going to show you uh, this is the example as well. So this launch ramps always have a lot of access. You're, uh, you're able to, um, you know, there's clearings, there's parking lots that you can fish from. So you really have uh, a lot of places that you can actually go cast, right? Um, now, here is the Google Maps trick. This is the lake at full pull right here. It's all the way up to as far as it can possibly go. Now, 
if I go, all right, I'm going to go out fishing tomorrow. This is the area that I'm going to fish. If you want to know some areas that you can focus more on, one of the features of Google Earth is that you can come and on the top left right here, you can you can see this. Um, I can scroll to a time that the lake was a lot lower. So look at this. I'm going to do this again because it might it might not even make sense right now until you see it back and forth. There's the lake when it's full. There's the lake on a huge drought. So one more time. If I'm going to fish like on this little point right here, I hope you guys can see the mouse uh, when you're watching, but let's just say I'm going to go fish on this point right here. I'm going to show you where this spot is once I go, once I make that water level go down again. It's right there. Okay, guys. So look, why do I want to fish from this little point? Well, look what we have here. We have uh, a parking lot. We have little gravel um, divides. We've got the gravel little bank right here, the riprap holding up this parking lot. So instead of me just going out to this area and, and, or just looking for random areas, because look, if I'm casting over here, I'm casting to nothing. But since I can see this water lower, I now know what's down there. I know that there is this parking lot. I know that I want to hit these little gravel areas. It's going to be perfect places for these fish to move up on. Um, because we're in the spawn, these fish would love to follow this little rock line right here and tuck right up in here to spawn. So lots of little places, lots of little things to learn about that water um, before you get out on there. And that goes for all the way along here. You get, you really get to see what else, um, what other options you have. And you wouldn't be able to tell that just looking at this map on this view. But once again, I got to keep showing you guys, this is something especially, I mean, you, you need to do this from the boat. Every pro does this before a tournament. Every single one on the FLW Tour, the Elite Series, MLF, every one of them goes to Google uh, Earth and looks at these things, um, especially on new bodies of water that they're fishing. And uh, if you look at this whole bank, it just kind of looks worthless uh, along here. But where the money's at is, is all over here. You can see how much other structure there is and stuff that's man-made that goes down there. There's even, uh, you know, this rock goes out a lot deeper on this specific spot. So you would probably want to fish that as well more. You can't tell right here. So look, you wouldn't even know where the uh, best places would be on here. But if you look again, you can see that this comes out to a little point right here on this, uh, on this major peninsula. And so this would be a great place to focus on as well. So guys, that is a huge trick that I've just given you, um, and it's and it's free. You can download Google Earth and and do this at, at no cost. Now another element. Let's see if I can pull this up. Hmm. Um, another element is going to be. Let me do this here. Navionics. All right, is an avionics. Um, this is the online. Uh, this is the website version. Uh, but this is also a, a downloadable app. And I think it's even free for like 90 days or 30 days or something when you sign up. So I suggest you, you try it out. And I suggest you sign up for it like right before you go fishing. So you're not, uh, you know, if you want to, you don't, it doesn't expire before you actually head out on the water and really get to use it. But uh, this is another thing. So this is already set up. Here's that same parking lot we were just looking at. Sorry, guys, this mouse is a little bit um, touchy. Uh so you can see this is that same little, that's that little peninsula we were talking about fishing from. It shows the contour lines and stuff, but you can learn a whole lot about a lake or a reservoir from uh, this Navionics uh, map. And what I like in the spring is you can see which one of these creeks, uh, which one of these little coves have creeks in them. You don't want to fish a cove that doesn't have a creek in them. Um, what happens is these fish in the spawn, uh, they, they're all in the deeper water in the winter time. And as things start to, uh, as things, as these fish start to spawn, they uh, move up these creek channels and they follow these creek channels and then they'll break off of them to go up and spawn where the conditions are right. Like on this little flat right here would be a perfect spot for these fish. They move up the creek, move into this little flat right here and spawn. So, uh, and as I look at this Navionics map, I can see the different places that actually have creeks. Um, and, and focus on which ones are deeper and, and really learn a whole lot about the conditions before I head out there. Once again, you have this app, uh, this, when you sign up for this membership, you have it on 
available on your computer as well as on your phone and uh, and can really have it handy while you're trying to find some places to go fish um, on the lake. So that is the Navionics. Let's stop that screen share. Um, so just the Google Maps and the uh, the Navionics, great tools to really learn your water before you go out there. Um, and then obviously take a look at the weather. Um, you know, if we take, a, for example, I'm going to take a look at the, uh, I'm going to bring up the weather I have because I'm going to be fishing Saturday. So the earlier you can look at this, uh, the more you can kind of anticipate what's going on. I want to know what's happened to these fish before I get there. And so looking at this uh, uh, weather report right now, we're in spring. 62, 61 degrees is not that cold. That's actually some decent weather. That's not going to, uh, you know, I don't even need to wear a, uh, a sweatshirt in 62 degree weather. But, and so what I like is cloud cover and rain. Um, rising water brings fish shallow. In the springtime, fish are looking for any reason they possibly can to come shallow. And when you have rising water, you're going to have flooded conditions. You're going to have brush and stuff that's up shallow getting submerged underwater. And these bass love that. The more the more cover, vegetation, anything that's up shallow for them to hide out or, or relate around is going to hold them up shallow longer. And they're going to be, and they'll go as shallow as they possibly can if there's cover and structure for them. And so when I'm looking at this weather right now, I'm seeing cloudy today, 62 degrees. The nights uh, getting down to 49, 48. That's still not bad. That's going to keep those water temps uh, about the same. Um, and then Friday, partly cloudy. Saturday, the sun's coming up, 66 degrees. I'm not loving Saturday. Uh, and that's actually when I'm going out. It's If we get some cloud cover, I'm going to like it a little bit more. But if that sun is out, it's 66 degrees. We could have... Uh, um, it could be a tough little bite, but when the sun's out, these fish are going to actually hold tighter to cover. So I know that looking at this, I've got to anticipate that where I go, the fish are going to want to be tucked into any kind of brush, um, any kind of shallow water structure, or they'll move out a little bit into a little bit deeper water. Um, so always take a look at that weather, be watching it because you want to know what's happened to these fish up until that point that you've gotten there. Um, and that's kind of just some little homework things that you guys can do. Just remember in the spring, these fish are looking to move shallow. They're looking to move right to you on the shore. So now let's talk about some equipment as we pack and get ready. Obviously we need lures and, and you know, the tackle that goes along with that. But uh, I'm talking more about um, all the different tools you need w when we're fishing from the shore were a lot more limited. If you look at my boat, I I can carry everything. I carry doubles of everything you've ever needed at, for every situation. But when you're fishing on the shore, you've got to be selective about what you bring out there. Um, and the more you know about the water you're going to fish, the more you can bring specific things to that um, uh, uh, to that fishery. But uh, for instance, when I go Saturday, I know what the, the little pond looks like. It's literally not even half an acre. It might be a quarter of an acre pond. It is like a, it's a giant puddle, but it's where I caught my first bass. I'm fairly certain there's still bass in there, but I have not fished it. I haven't caught a bass out of it in, um, shoot, I want to say like 15 years, maybe 18 years. So, so I'm not completely sure what the conditions are going to be, but I still remember there's some brush, there's a deeper end of the lake, there's a little shallower end. So I just need to have some versatile stuff. But you want to know, is there going to be vegetation? Is the lake totally covered over with, um, you know, basically that slime algae stuff so you can only fish topwater things? Um, the more you know, the more you can limit what you bring. But I know that as fishermen, the most people that are bank fishing get limited time they're out on the water. And so the conditions are always changing. So you really got to bring some versatile stuff. Um, and uh, so the first thing I want to talk about is rod selection. Um, I use, uh, if you guys, if you guys watch any of the videos, you know that I use sticks fishing. It's something I've partnered up with, with uh, Nick, the informative fisherman, and we created six rods to fish all lures and techniques. The industry we decided has been doing it incorrectly uh, for years. And we said, okay, we're going to look at the golf model and say, okay, if golf can have a set of golf clubs, then we can make a set of, of fishing uh, rods. And that's what we did with sticks. It's all you need in six rods. Now, you don't always have to have those six rods with you. So when I head out on, uh, 
uh, to the local pond that I don't know much about or uh, I want to be extremely versatile, I use the number two and the number three stick, which are the two most versatile rods in our lineup. Uh, they really are, uh, you know, they can really cover anything from, uh, it's one's a spinning rod, one's a bait casting rod, so they can fish your finesse baits and they can fish a little bit of your bigger baits as well. You know, if you're going to throw some real heavy, nasty stuff, you'll need some bigger rods uh, in the set, but but these are our most versatile too. And that's what I'll be bringing up to the uh, little pond on um, on Saturday. And that's going to be a mile, mile and a half hike uphill to go fish this. And so, uh, so I've got to make sure I pack what I can actually bring up there because I'm also going to bring camera gear, computers. So it, you've got to be really uh, careful that you're not packing stuff you don't need. Um, some other things when I'm fishing from the shore, uh, fishing line. Uh, there's two different things I want to talk about fishing line. The first one is, is shore anglers. I made this mistake and I didn't kind of really realize this till later on. But when I'm fishing the shore, I used to use lighter line. And the reality is there's benefits. You, you want to use the lightest line you can get away with a lot of times because it gives the bait better action. It, it makes the baits dive deeper. Now, the fish don't see it as well. But when you're fishing from the shore, I actually use heavier line than I normally would from a boat. And the reason being is if I snag from a boat, I can go over to that snag and I can get it out. When you're fishing from the shore and you cast that crankbait or whatever it is and you snag, um, you are uh, you can't go get it unless you're going to go swim. I know that we've all gotten in the water to go swim. We've done some weird stuff to retrieve our lures. But uh, what I want to use, I use heavier line so that, and then actually thinner hooks. I'll replace with thinner wire hooks so that I have a better chance of pulling that hook out a little bit. So it'll straighten that hook and that bait uh, will come free before the line snaps. And so that way you can hopefully lose less lures when you're out there. Um, and so that's a little trick I learned basically later on, heavier line. The other thing is I will bring some braid. Um, I'm going to be using, uh, I think, 12-pound uh, fluorocarbon on my bait casting rod tomorrow. But I will always carry some braid because if I come to some, if I come to the part of the lake where I'm like, oh, my gosh, the fish are all in the heavy, thick structure and cover, um, I need something heavier to flip in there because they're just going to snap my line if I go into nasty stuff like that. Uh, or if I need to cast a frog into some crazy things, I will then just put some line on top of my line. So I won't re-spool it. All I'll do is I'll tie a uh, uni to uni knot and I will just reel in, you know, 30 or 40 yards of braid on top of that and, and then use that as I need it. And if I'm done using that braid, I'll take it off. You can actually wrap that braid back onto something and save that braid for later and then go back to my mono or floral carbon. So so don't think you need to completely change line or all your line just to adapt to the situation. Braid is uh, very easy to take on and off and make sure you don't use too much. Braid's expensive. You don't need to use more than you're going to use. Um, if I'm just flipping, there's times if I'm flipping the bank, I might not need more than 10 feet of braided line on my uh, on my reel. And so I'll just put 10, 15 feet on there, do the flipping stuff. When I'm done with that, I'll pull it off and, and go back with my uh, fluorocarbon. So trick with the lines, uh, hopefully that helps you guys out a little bit. Then let's talk about some different tools uh, for the equipment. Um, always, always carry pliers. Pliers are so important um, as safety and for getting the hooks out of the fish's mouth. Uh, there's just a bunch of situations. Do not get caught out there without pliers. Uh, it's, it's, it's irresponsible not to bring pliers out with you. Um, if you get a hook in the hand or something and you need to get it out, that's you know a safety issue. But then also with the fish, they're going to get gut hooked. They're going to get uh, the trouble hooks are going to be all in there. And the longer it takes you to get those hooks out, the the more vulnerable the fish are to, to being permanently injured. So always carry a uh, set of pliers with you and have them accessible so you can use them whenever you need them. Um, uh, scissors. Uh, you always want to carry some scissors with you uh, to be cutting any line. Uh, another thing is cutting line that's... Um, that you find out there, you know, line might be snagged around a tree or something and you can cut it free. Uh, that, and that brings me to the next thing, a trash bag. I always bring some kind of little Ziploc bag or trash bag that you can clean up trash on the lake. When you go out there, take ownership of the places that you fish, pick up the trash that you see. Um, I always look at it. I, I never, ever pass up any kind of trash that I see out there uh, because I know I've left a lot of trash in the lakes and uh, not on purpose, but 
you know, I know we snag lures, things fly out of our boat as we're driving. We don't realize it. Uh, there's just uh, accidental things that happen. And so by always making sure you're cleaning up any trash you see, you're evening it out, hopefully leaving it better than you found it. Um, then also a little sneak peek, guys. These little scissors, these must add scissors, will be coming in one of the future boxes. I'm not sure if it is this month's or next month's. But uh, must add is including some of their little scissors. That's part of our experience by adding in uh, all the different tools that you need in there. Keep moving along, guys. Uh, another thing to bring um, a little medical first aid kit. Uh, you, I know that there's a, unlimited things that can go wrong out there. And not only that, you can run into somebody who needs medical attention, which I've had multiple times happen to me when I've been out there is running into people that, that have had something happen and I can help them out. Um, because I have medical equipment to, uh, to patch them up a little bit. Um, also, super glue works fantastic for all that stuff as well. Uh, let's see, bring a scale. Guys, you're going to catch your big fish. You know, you're going to catch one that's uh, maybe your personal best, or you're just going to catch one that you're like, oh, man, can't wait to tell people about that. Weigh it so you, so you can back up your story. So when they try to call BS on you, you can back that up and you have the scale ready to go. Um, here's another thing. Uh, bring a... Uh, soda, uh, Pepsi, Mountain Dew, whatever it is, bring that. And uh, if you get a fish, and the reason it's not for you to drink, uh, is if you get a fish that you've got hooked, that you've hooked in the um, uh, gills or anything like that, and it's bleeding, you can actually give it, you pour the soda in its uh, down its throat and on its gills. And the, uh, the caffeine or whatever it is will actually uh, clot the blood. And so it will stop the bleeding. And then it actually, that the caffeine gives that fish some energy. And, and so you have a, a way better chance of uh, helping that fish survive by giving it some medical attention. And just doing that with a soda uh, works wonders. And then you can release it and it will be able to, uh, to survive. So a good little tip there. Um, there's always uh, extra stuff. Oh, I guess the last thing is actually the most important tool in bass fishing. If, if you were to say, Travis, what is the Number one thing you have to have to have when you go out on the water, it is sunglasses. You have to have a good set of polarized sunglasses. And that goes from even being from the shore. You need to know what's below the surface. You need to see any kind of logs that are right below. You need to see what kind of little critters and things are up, up, up on the shallows, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, little tiny uh, bait fish swimming underneath there, whether it's salamanders, uh, what kind of grass there is, let alone seeing fish follow in your baits. Um, there, there's so much to learn. If you don't have the sunglasses, you're going to miss out on that. And if you don't have polarized sunglasses, you, you're not, you're not fishing even close to what you're the potential you should be fishing on any day. Even if there's cloudy co cover going on, you've got to have sunglasses because you're still, it's cutting away the glare and you're able to see in the water a whole lot better. So that is it for the equipment. Now let's move to the, the nitty gritty. Let's get down to the baits. Um, when we're fishing from the shore, we've, we've already mentioned this, we have limited amount of uh, tackle that we can bring out there. So we want our baits to be versatile. Uh, I'm going to start with, uh, well, first we want top water. We want baits that we can cover water with. Uh, and then I like to have some kind of little like swim bait type, uh, little, little smaller type swim baits. So first let's talk about uh, top water baits. Um, I really like either a popper. Um, uh, and I had somebody ask me about uh, the question whether a popper is actually a versatile bait. And the answer is yes. Um, I can work at real uh, small pops, pop, 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 or I can do violent ones, drawing fish up, drawing violent strikes. I can pause this bait for extended periods of time to get fish to come up and I can walk it. If I do little twitches on slack line, this bait will actually pop and walk like a, like a walking bait. Um, and poppers work really good, especially for small ponds and things. Uh, that's going to be one of your best top water baits. Um, and then having like a, a smaller uh, little frog uh, ponds will get grassed over really quickly. There's going to be a lot of vegetation as the sun comes up as the, uh, as warm weather hits and yeah, I'm not sure if you guys can hear in the background, if you guys are hearing a child screaming, that is my own child. He is wake, he's waking up, but uh, he does have, he's not by himself. My, uh, my mother is taking care of him right now. So he is not just screaming, uh, wanting his father. Um, all right. So the frog, you can throw it up in all this vegetation and in these little ponds, uh, bass, 
they learn to be uh, uh, not picky eaters. And they know that they're going to eat anything that goes in there, whether it's a little mouse or a frog. And they know that that the best, biggest food is usually coming from the shoreline. So having a little frog is great. I actually like this little Scott Martin um, live target popping frog because it's actually got a cupped face. So it's actually a popper and a frog in one. So you could pop this, walk it, throw it over nasty cover and stuff because it's weedless. So, so many advantages to have. This is one of my favorite uh, topwater baits for fishing from the shore. Um, okay, now one that that is a little bit more, uh, this isn't going to be as as used and especially shore anglers are, are skeptical about buzz baits uh, because most beginning anglers are very skeptical about buzz baits. But I will promise you one thing, guys. If for the rest of the season, uh, actually through the summer, if you commit to every time you walk up to your local pond uh, or even the lake or whatever it is, and your first dozen cats, but buzz black, I like better, but um, you throw it a dozen times and, and then you go, okay, I did that for Travis. I'm going to cut it off and I'm going to go back to whatever I wanted to fish. I promise you are going to catch some of the biggest fish you've ever caught in the season. Uh, for some reason, whatever it is, that buzz bait calls up the biggest fish in a body of water and, and they just can't resist it. And so uh, you may go a couple times where you don't get anything, but, and you may be cursing him, but that lied to me. He, he steered me wrong. But when that, that hits and you catch the monster bass, you'll be like, Travis was not kidding. And I know that this sometimes just looks like a repurposed beer can. So it can be, you're like, dude, this looks like crap. These things are lethal. All right, now let's move to baits that you can uh, you can move that you can move through the water column. Um, that is, uh, and that, that we we discussed this. I'm not going to get too much detail of this because we talked about these in our uh, uh, basics top five basic baits that you can use anytime. The most versatile baits, uh, a spinner bait can really go through grass. It's it's fairly weedless, so it works. Uh, so that's why it's a versatile bait. You can bounce it off of wood. You can pull it through grass. You can swim at different water depths. So if you've got grass or, or gnarly bottom, you can reel it faster and, and not have it go along the bottom. Or if you have a bottom and really smash it as well. So very special bait, a lipless. You can cast a long ways and it creates a lot of noise. It's got a nice little uh, vibrating action as well. And uh, this is just a lipless crankbait is a very versatile bait that you can catch fish all over the place. And, uh, and you can cover water with uh, with it really well, which we'll talk about as well, uh, more in tactics. Um, then a jerkbait, uh, especially in the spring, jerkbaits are fantastic and they're great from the shore because you're going to get hung up in water columns. You don't actually get down to the bottom and uh, and so you're not going to, you're not going to hang it up as much. Um, a jerkbait is going to um, work best in clear water. So that you can, if you've got real clear water, five to 10 feet, the jerk bait will be money for you. You can really uh, jerk that bait, it puts off a flash. It's going to get the fish's attention and they'll come up and hit that bait when you're, when you have it paused. So those are the moving baits. Um, then let's talk. Uh, one of the things that I've always found, especially now shifting over to um, smaller ponds is that a lot of guys use the same exact baits when they're fishing ponds. They use a lot of uh, plastics, uh, a lot of lipless crankbaits, maybe some spinner baits. Um, but what I found, if you throw uh, a smaller little style, a uh, little swim bait like this, these little hard baits, little segmented baits, uh, this is a Biwa, I think it was called Biwa 7. This was the uh, Ragnar. Um, little swim bait. There's a couple of different companies that make this bait. Both of these have been featured in past Lucky Tackle boxes. Um, you throw this out there a few times, the fish will tell you real quick if they're chewing. And if they are, um, it's real obvious. And that's another thing. You can throw this bait, you throw a half a dozen times, a dozen times, and you don't catch a fish right away and go to one of your other baits. But uh, when you're on, uh, I have found in small ponds, you throw a little swim bait like that, you can catch some great fish. Um, another thing, if the water's clear, if you're fishing a little lake or, uh, you know, a little bit more heavily fished area, you can throw on like a little smaller swim bait. This is a VNM's little swim bait. Just put a little ball head, like a quarter of it, throw it on a spinning rod. Um, it, it just has a very natural, realistic look. It's great 
uh, action and uh, you're going to catch fish with a small little swim bait like that. Um, so those are uh, really all our moving baits. And uh, once again, if you guys have any questions on those, uh, let's uh, make sure you ask them and I will address those a little bit later uh, in the show once I've gone through these things. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is one of the most versatile. We're going go, to go to soft plastics now. And what I first want to talk about is a Texas rig um, and, and how to set that up. And so let me get a bait out. The Texas rig, and, and this, and so maybe some of you guys already know all about this and, and you can just, uh, you know, be happy that you do, but I want to make sure that I'm not going over anybody's head right now. So I want to talk about uh, one of the most versatile setups is a Texas rig. And a, a Texas rig is, is really actually just rigged up weedless. Um, and it's actually how you rig it. So you've got your hook and you're going to come through uh, about an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch down on whatever soft plastic you're using. So you go right through the head right there. And then you pull that bait all the way through to the eye of the hook. And then I'm going to reverse that hook so it faces the bait. And I want that hook to end up flush with the bait. So I'm going to measure up what that looks like. So now I know where actually I need to put the hook through the bait. So as I push that through there, I'm going to pop the hook through the other side. And see how that tip has come out now? And then I'm going to bury the tip of the hook. I'm going to skin hook it is what it's called. Just underneath there. So now that, that setup is weedless. That is Texas rigged, okay? Now you can add some different elements to that. Um, the first thing you see here is I have a bead on there. This bead is to add a little more noise. I've got a bullet, which is a quarter ounce tungsten weight right here. And as I shake this bait down there, you'll hear it click. Let's see if I can get it on here. See, as I shake that, you're hearing that clicking noise. When um, you want to use that when the water clarity is a foot or less. And that little clicking noise will bring the fish in. It can really help them hone into where that's coming from, that there's something alive up there, and they'll search it out. Um, more times than not, I'm not using a bead. Once again, this is more for that murkier water. If you want to give your bait a little bit more of a, a different sound or look than, than everyone else is using. Um, and so when I've got soft plastics, you guys just saw the, the stick bait right there. Um, one of the most important soft plastics to have, the reason this is so important is because of how versatile it is. When you get out there, you can rig this a lot of different ways. So you want to carry a lot of terminal tackle in terms of, uh, you know, little beads, the different types of hooks, weighted hooks, nails, so that you can adapt to the conditions that you have out there. The little pond that I'm going to fish, so, so you've got the stick bait, but then you want creature baits. So we talked about the uh, little hog style bait. Very good bait to use out there. You can rig that up, Texas rig. Um, when I go fish Saturday, I'm going to be using a little uh, Riot's little crawdad bait. This came in the box a long time ago. And this is a, a real natural looking fish up in the overhanging trees. So they're most likely going to be up in there uh, tucked away but I still want to throw them a little small profile, a little juvenile looking um, uh, bluegill type thing. And what I do is I will color the, the backs of those legs, the very tips of them, chartreuse. Then the last tactic is, uh, or sorry, the last type of bait is some kind of little worm. You want just a little straight worm. This is for when you find areas that you know the fish are there and you just need to really slow down and keep that presentation right in front of them. And you can do that with... Uh, either a shaky head or what I like is a drop shot. And if I'm working along a dock or something, I'll cast the end of the dock and I'll just lift that rod and just let it sit there for a sec, shake it a little bit. And then I'll drag it another couple feet and just let it sit. And that'll keep that bait right in the water column. Sometimes these fish are just sitting there not proactively feeding. And so if you can keep a fish in front of them around them, or you can keep a lure in front of them around them long enough, they'll eventually just uh, check it out. They get curious, they get territorial, whatever the, the reason, um, they'll eventually just pop it, you know, they'll spit it away from them or they'll just suck it in real quick to see what it is. And that's when you can set the hook on that. This is a little big, uh, big bite baits. Uh, one of their little, uh, just straight, straight worms. And this came in the box, uh, I think last year, 
They also make a squirrel, which is a great shaky head bait that has a floating tail that always floats up. So they make some good stuff. You will be seeing more big bites uh, baits in the box soon. But so now that we talked about some of these versatile lures, let's now go uh, over to our tactics. Uh, we've talked about this. There's lots of advantages from fishing from the shore. Uh, and, and in the spring, especially, you've got to understand that these bass are trying to come shallow. They want to come into the shallows. Now, they need a couple things that are going to make higher percentage areas. Year round, the more structure or cover you have up shallow, the more likely those bass are going to be up there and stay up there. Um, and uh, because they want to feel comfortable. If there's really just bare bank, They'll still go up shallow to feed, but it's only in very small windows. And also it has to do if there's bait fish up there that they chase up there, they'll feed. But then the second there's no more food for them or they're, or they're not feeding anymore, they'll go back out to where they feel comfortable. But if you've got overhanging trees, if you've got shallow grass, they'll stay up there even longer um, and, and you'll be able to target them more. So you want to fish areas. You want to understand when you're fishing the shore, you've got to identify that there is reasons for them to be up shallow guys when i go to a uh, particular type of water um i i usually do what i call the hot lap and i've talked about this in other live shows i want to cover water as quickly as possible and that's why you know a lot of times i like a little lipless crankbait because if it's a small pond um the first thing i'll do is just make the hot lap i'll go around casting a lipless crankbait i don't even care if i catch fish really i just want something that i have confidence in catching fish but i want to check out the water I want to see where the deeper parts of the lake are, where, you know, if I go full lap, I might see a bunch of bait fish or even bass up shallow in one area of that lake a little bit better. But a lot of times if you just start fishing in one spot and don't move around, you, you spend too much time in that area. And then later on realize, oh man, the fish are over here. I should have been fishing over there. So you want to cover some water first, get the lay of the land and then slow down a little bit. Um, the other thing is how much access do you have out there? Uh, there are certain areas that I go fish from the shore and I may only have a hundred yards of fishable water that I can get to. The rest maybe is private property or it's literally just too much overgrowth and stuff I can't get to. So even if it looks better in those areas, if I can't fish it, then I'm SOL, right? So when you've if you have a very limited amount of area you can fish, you're gonna have to be more uh, you're gonna have to think out how you narrow down okay if i go through the lipless or i go through with the spinnerbait don't get anything i've got to slow down and go back through with some finesse baits a little drop shot a slow moving little uh you know creature bait or something like that and really slow down and and fish it a little bit more effectively a little more thoroughly so uh and if you have a lot of area cover a lot of water or cover that area faster and figure out where you want to spend more time in. So the, the amount of accessible water definitely dictates what lures you're going to use and how much time you spend in an area. Um, something else is fishing the strike zone as beginning anglers. A lot of times we make the mistake of thinking long casts are your friend. It's all about, Oh, I got this new rod. Look how far I can cast. When you're fishing from the shore, we just talked about these fish want to be up to the shore. A lot of times, a, a lot more than you really understand, those fish are right at your feet. They're right at your toes. And if you're making long casts, you are not casting towards the fish. Um, look at the boats that are coming by. Where are they casting? They're casting at the shore. So um, instead of casting way out deep, you want to be making your casts along the shoreline. Uh, a lot of times, for a lot, they're going to be when you're right there, when you can walk up that shoreline. So when you walk up that shoreline, you can cast along, parallel along the shore, maybe five feet off the shore down the bank. So you can bring that bait through the strike zone the entire time and you will be in front of the fish for longer. Um, and so it's very important that you know where the strike zone is and you're spending as much time in that area and not casting way past them. Uh, it's something that I see a lot of anglers do and they don't realize those fish are right up close to them. Uh, the last part about tactics I want to talk about is, uh, the selfie effect. You guys are always hearing me talk about this, uh, launch ramps. Launch ramps are usually accessible. 
these guys in bass boats uh, go out, and I'm, I'm guilty of doing this as well, we'll go out and we'll fish and we'll keep a couple good fish. We'll keep one or two and we'll go, okay, let, let's uh, bring those back in. Let's take some pictures at the dock real quick before we release them. And when you have boats doing this, you know, constantly day in and day out, when you have tournaments going out of the uh, – uh, out of those areas, they're going out and catching all the fish in the lake and bringing them back and releasing them right in that area. Those launch ramps get packed with some of the biggest fish in the entire lake. So if you want to catch one of your personal best, if you want quality fish or you want an area that you go, Travis, I just need a one area that I can focus on, have confidence to, to try these techniques and catch fish. It's launch ramps, fish around the launch ramps. There's always fish there. And, uh, and you'll be able to use these techniques and to catch some of those fish as well. That's my number one top, uh, tip that I give people fishing from the shore because I know it works. I see it work all the time. Okay, guys. Um, that's going to be it for us uh, on the Bank Fishing 101. Um, if you guys want more content, you are in luck. Yesterday, I went through all our previous videos over the last five years, and I got all the videos that I made from the shore. Is I've made it, you know, I, I think there's probably seven or eight videos in there that I made from the shore. And that is our new playlist titled Shore Fishing uh, on our YouTube channel. So if you want some more shore techniques, go ahead over to that playlist right now and, and check that out. Uh, I think that there'll be a lot of useful information for you guys as well. So anyway, thank you guys for watching. Make sure you tune back in on Saturday because we're going to be going live uh, to to a very special place in my past, that little pond, or to the place I'm not supposed to be fishing. I've never fished there, but I know there's bass, but I know the security is tight there. So we're going to try to get through, do some Mission Impossible stuff and, and eventually get booted out. But hopefully we'll catch a couple of fish before we do. So anyway, guys, appreciate you watching. And always remember, there is no one that works harder to help you fish better. I'm Travis Moran, and I will catch you out on the water.